This morning we're continuing in the uh, Gospel of Mark, and we're not going to get through it as quickly as you are as far as reading the Bible uh, together. But hopefully, as you've been reading through Mark, you've recognized uh, some of the things we've been looking at and remembered some of the things that have been said about it. We're going to be looking this morning at chapter 14, verses 27 through 31. Very familiar passage, I think, to all of us. We've read through the Gospels on numerous occasions. Christ's prediction that his disciples are all going to fall away from him. And we need to realize that they were not unique in the fact that they fell away from him. They also were not unique in the fact that the Lord later, later strengthened them to be able to stand. But what we do want to see from this is God's sovereignty. So let's read the text to begin with. Mark 14, verses 27 through 31. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away. Because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly, I say to you that this very night, before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing also. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding. Now you do realize that they did exactly what Jesus told them they were going to do. They did not stand, but they fell away. So we're going to take a look at what that means, why that happened. So we, we saw last week that after the Lord's Supper, they sang a hymn, even in the midst of the difficult times they were facing, they, they worshiped the Lord through a series of psalms that talked about the work of, what, of Jesus Christ, what he was going to do and what was going to come about through that work. Singing in the midst of difficulties is something that we ought to be doing, whether things are going well or things are going difficult. We should always praise the Lord. If it's going well, praise him for the fact it's going well. If difficult times are coming, praise him for the fact he's going to work good things out of those difficult times. But then after they sang the hymn, after the Passover was over, Jesus and his disciples went out to the Mount of Olives to pray. And it was here that Jesus made a, what we might say, a surprising prediction, at least from the disciples' perspective, regarding what it is they were shortly going to do. One that we would have to say caught them all off guard. You will all fall away, Jesus said. Now, we often pick on Peter. You know, Peter, you're going to deny me three times, but we need to realize it wasn't just Peter. They were all insisting they weren't going to fall away, but Jesus says you will all fall away on account of me. You're all going to abandon me. Now, how did Jesus know that that was going to happen? Well, it's because of what the Scripture said. I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Well, we know that scripture is God's word. We know that whatever God says is going to come to pass. God's word can't be wrong. Jesus knew what was going to take place because this is something that had been prophesied. Now, Jesus was about to be struck down as we've already seen. He was about to be betrayed by Judas. He has already gone to uh, gather the temple guard as it were to come out and to arrest Jesus. And Jesus is going to be handed over to the Romans. Jesus is going to be crucified. The shepherd is going to be struck down. But again, Jesus reminds them this is not going to be the end. He is going to be raised again. Remember, Jesus made the promise to his disciples, you will eat with me at my table in my kingdom. I will drink this wine with you again new in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says here, after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Jesus is going to be killed, but he is going to be raised again. And they would be there to see it, which is very comforting, especially because of what they were about to do. When the shepherd is struck down, the sheep were going to be scattered. So who are these sheep? Well, it's referring to them. They are the sheep. They are the ones who are going to abandon him. They are the ones who are going to deny him. But how, how could this be, the disciples are thinking? 
How can we deny the one that we love most of all? Well, Peter, of course, was the first one to object. Even though all fall away from you, Lord, I will not fall away. These may not be able to stand, but I will. I will never abandon you. And, of course, Jesus addresses him because he was the one who was first to speak up. He says, Peter, truly I say to you, this very night before a rooster crows, you yourself will deny me not just once, but three times. And again, Peter was insisting, even if I have to die with you, Lord, I will not deny you. And the rest of them said the same thing. Now, the sad truth is, as you know, that even knowing ahead of time what Jesus said they were going to do so that they might fortify themselves, that they might be on their guard against it when the opportunity actually came to do this, when the time came, they did exactly what Jesus said they were going to do. They abandoned him. Every single one of them abandoned him. Not one of them was able to stand. Now, what does this tell us? Well, I think it tells us really a couple of things. That ultimately, we are not in control of the things that happen in our lives, even of the things that we actually choose to do. God is the one who is in control. And yes, we know the Bible says that we are free to make the choices that we make. We are free to choose what we want. But we need to understand at the same time, God is in absolute control even of those choices. And so it tells us, secondly, that if we are to stand before the Lord, if we are to stand firm in the faith and not fall away like the disciples did, we are only going to be able to do it by God's grace. And thankfully, God has promised to give us that grace so that we'll be able to stand. Now, I want us to consider those two things this morning, maybe to get, hopefully, a little more insight into it. First, God is the one who is in absolute control of all things. Now, why did the disciples all fall away from Jesus? Why did they abandon him in his time of greatest need? Why wasn't even one of them able to stand? Well, ultimately, it was because it was God's will. Jesus said, it is written. This is going to take place. Now, we need to understand that he said that not because he looked ahead in time and saw how they were going to respond and then wrote it down. They did this because it was God's plan. It could not have happened in any other way. God is in absolute control over everything. So let's, uh, let's uh, try to understand that for just a minute. The absolute sovereignty of God. This was something, by the way, that uh, we saw God teach Nebuchadnezzar. Something he discovered as the Lord brought him through this particular process. After he took his reason away from him, and then he returned it, the first thing that Nebuchadnezzar saw was God's absolute sovereignty. He thought he was sovereign. Remember the boasting that he did on top of uh, Babylon? This is not great Babylon that I, that I have built by my own power for the glory of my majesty. Well, the Lord taught him otherwise. No, he did not do that. It wasn't his. He didn't build it for his glory and nor by his power. It was something that God actually did. And that was the first thing Nebuchadnezzar saw when his reason was returned to him. He said this, which is one of the most uh, straightforward passages on the sovereignty of God in Scripture. All the inhabitants of the earth, that means not just the creatures that are, you know, the beasts and so forth, but it means man. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. Well, it's quite a bit different than the view that God exists for our well-being. They are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? By the way, Nebuchadnezzar was not the only one who discovered this. Paul also discovered the same thing when he was on his way to Damascus while he was still Saul the Pharisee in order to arrest all the Christians that he found and drag them back to Jerusalem for trial and for execution. You know, the furthest thing from his mind and his heart on that day was that he himself would become 
that which he despised, that he himself would become a Christian. But the Lord arrested him on that day, arrested his progress down the road of destruction, and turned his heart towards him. So that Paul could later say, again, one of the most pointed passages in Scripture describing the sovereignty of God in Ephesians 1.11. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Those are absolute terms. God exercises absolute control over everything that happens. And the hosts of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth, everything that takes place in the world. Do you know that God was also absolutely sovereign, as again, um, Nebuchadnezzar reminds us over what happens in the hosts of heaven? He's not talking about the sun, moon, and the stars. I think he's talking about the angels. God is sovereign over the angels. He was sovereign over those that would fall in Lucifer's rebellion, those who would become demons, and those that would stand and become the servants of those who would inherit salvation, the holy angels. You know, I think the fact that the, the angels, being superior in their minds and superior in strength and power, the fact that God told them that they would become the servants of fallen mankind that he would redeem and make the heirs of salvation, that was too much for one angel in particular to, to really uh, be able to accept uh, Lucifer. He wanted to exalt his throne above that of God, to, to yield and become a servant to this, this creature that was much, much below him, was more than he could stand, and apparently more than some of the angels could stand as well. So they fell away from the Lord because of their pride. It's very likely that that is the reason why the rebellion took place in heaven. It was a matter of a pride issue. But the angels that did not fall, it's also interesting, Scripture are called the chosen angels. They are the elect angels, which means that God was exercising his sovereignty even over the angels as to which would fall and which ones would stand. He would give grace to his chosen angels to stand. Paul writes to Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. Nebuchadnezzar recognized rightly, God does according to his will among the hosts of heaven. He saved some, basically. He held on to them so they wouldn't fall away. He gave them grace, but he allowed the others to rebel. And as you know, God worked that in such a way that it brings glory to him and ultimately good to us. God also does according to his will among the inhabitants of the earth. He is involved in the affairs of mankind, as we see with Nebuchadnezzar. But remember, um, he does that in everyone's life. Sometimes people recognize it, sometimes they don't. Hannah recognized it when she prayed to the Lord and asked that the Lord would open her womb and give her a son. And she promised to give, it, give the son to the Lord if, she, if he would do that. And the Lord gave her Samuel, and she gave Samuel to the Lord in order to serve him in his tabernacle. But this is what Hannah prays after she gives Samuel to Eli, the high priest. 1 Samuel 2, verses 4 through 8. Now listen carefully to this. The bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren gives birth to seven, but she who has many children languishes. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. Why is it that these things and things like them take place in the world? It's because it is God's will. One, one particularly pointed example comes when Judah is under siege by the king of Assyria. He sends his messenger Sennacherib to bring a message from the king of Assyria telling him, they have no hope against his armies. 
We have destroyed all the nations around you. Their gods were not able to save them. Your God cannot save you either. Well, this is what the Lord had to say to him regarding his great conquests and, of course, what was going to happen to him. The Lord said, Isaiah 37, 26, and 27, Have you not heard? Long ago, I did it. From ancient times, I planned it. Now I have brought it to pass that you should turn fortified cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore, their inhabitants were short of strength. They were dismayed and put to shame. The reason why you conquered them was because I did it, the Lord says. And then he goes on to say, I'm going to put a hook in your nose, and I'm going to drag you back to the land where you came from, and there I'm going to destroy you. You see, the king of Assyria was not the one who did it. It wasn't because of his plans. It wasn't because of his army. It was because of God's plans. God is the one who did it. The king of Assyria was the instrument that he used. God is sovereign over everything that takes place in the world. Most importantly, as we've already seen, he is sovereign over those who will be saved and those who will not among the inhabitants of the earth. Paul writes in Ephesians 1, verses 4 through 6, He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Boy, if we had time to look at that particular passage, we have no excuse for thinking. No one has an excuse for thinking. They chose God. God chose them. He chose us. If you're a Christian this morning, it's because God chose you. He chose us in him. Before the foundation of the world, before he had created anything, that we would be holy and blameless, not because we would be holy and blameless, but so that we would be holy and blameless. He predestined us to adoption. And the only reasons given is not because you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, not because he looked ahead and saw that you would choose him, but he says, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. His grace is the only reason given. Again, in Romans chapter 9, he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth, so then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? God does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now, does this mean that the things that take place in this world take place and they, they couldn't happen any other way? That's exactly what it means. Does it mean that the disciples didn't really have a choice as to whether or not they would stand with Jesus or abandon Jesus? Now, we have to be careful here. Yes, they had a choice. They could choose to stand with Jesus as they said they were going to do, or they could choose to abandon him. They were free to choose what they wanted. But now listen to this. God's plan made it certain that they were going to choose to abandon him. But they did it freely because that's what they wanted. God did not force them to do anything against their will. He simply used the sin that was in their hearts to bring this about. Now you need to realize not much later than this, when Jesus, after he had died, rose again from the dead, appeared to them for 40 days, ascended into heaven 10 days later on the day of Pentecost, pours out his Holy Spirit, gives them from that day forward the power to stand, although not infallibly. But the Lord did not give them that power in the garden. They all 
fell away. So he determined not to do anything to prevent them from choosing what they were going to choose. God is sovereign over whether he will give grace or whether he won't give grace. God is sovereign over everything that takes place in the world. Even when he sent his son into the world, it was absolutely certain that his people would reject his son, be handed over to the Romans, and he would be crucified because that was his plan. Here's another very pointed passage in Scripture, Acts chapter 4, verses 27 and 28. After the disciples had been uh, arrested and threatened and released, they prayed this. Actually, I think it was James and John in this case. But the disciples prayed when they came back. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. I don't think you could say it any clearer than that. What they did to Jesus was exactly what God had planned. Did God force them to do this? No. No more than he forced the disciples to abandon him in the garden. He simply let them make their choice freely, knowing that that's exactly what they would choose because he didn't give them the grace to choose otherwise. God is in absolute control of all these things. Now let's move on to the second point, which is really the application of this. Now if this is true, that God is in absolute sovereign control of all things, if you and I are to stand firm in the faith, we can only do it by the grace of God. I want you to see that from first to last, the work of salvation is the work solely of God's grace. Now, it does, of course, sanctification has something to do with us. But ultimately, that level we're going to obtain is in God's hands as well. Now, let me remind you, first of all, what we've already seen. In order to receive Jesus Christ, God had to give you the grace to begin with in order to trust him. Because remember what the Bible says about you, you were born dead in sin. You were the children of wrath, even as the rest. You could do nothing good. You were in the flesh, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. There was nothing you could do to save yourself. You could not even receive the Lord Jesus Christ. You were not capable of doing that. The Lord had to give you his grace sovereignly before you could receive his son. And that's what he was pleased to do. If you are trusting in him this morning, you are only doing that because God gave you the grace to do that out of his sovereign good pleasure for the glory of his grace. So make sure that if you are trusting Jesus this morning, you first of all give him thanks for the ability to do that. But now we've already seen that your salvation, my salvation, isn't the only thing God has planned. He's also planned everything else that's going to happen in your life. Everything that has happened is happening and will happen in the future. Everything is a part of that plan. Nothing that happens to you is outside of his control. But again, I want you to see from the example of the disciples who were his children, his elect, his called ones, and who had something of the Holy Spirit in their lives because they were actually true believers, that his plan includes your response to the things that God will bring into your life. God's plan includes whether you're going to stand or whether you're going to fall into sin. But of course, it also includes the fact, if you're a believer, that he's going to bring you out of that sin and you're going to stand all the way to the end. The Lord is in control even of these things. God gives grace and God withholds grace according to his will, but he always does it for a good reason in the lives of his children. Let's take a few examples of this. I mean, again, as far as God's sovereignty, the, um, we know that God is the one from these other passages who does what he does because it's a part of his plan. Okay, these things just don't happen accidentally. Now let's ask this question. 
Could the Lord have prevented Adam and Eve from falling in the garden? You think God could have stopped them? The one who has infinite power and strength, could he have prevented that from taking place? Could he have given Adam and Eve a greater measure of his Holy Spirit to the point where there was no way they could possibly fall? Well, I believe the Lord could do that. I hope you believe that too, because God can do whatever he desires. But did God do that? Well, obviously not. And why didn't he do that? Because it was a part of his plan that the fall would take place. God wanted there to be a fall. I know many Christians today hearing that would, would just shudder at the thought. But it's true. God wanted there to be a fall in order that he might glorify himself. Remember, the world was not made for man. The world was made for God's glory so that he might reveal his glory. And it was a part of his plan to allow man to fall so that he might reveal something about himself, his mercy, his grace, and his justice. We would never have seen just how gracious and merciful God is in saving those who were his enemies if he had not brought about the fall, if he had not allowed that to take place in his plan. If God had not allowed the fall to take place, we would know nothing about the justice of God in holding men accountable for their sins, on the other hand. There are certain aspects to God's being that we would never have known. Now, could he have stopped Judas, on the other hand, from betraying Jesus? Could he have stopped Peter from denying him? Could he have stopped the disciples from abandoning him? Well, yes, he could have done that if he wanted to, but he didn't. And again, the question is why? Well, if Jesus hadn't been betrayed by Judas and handed over to, the, to Israel's leaders in order to hand them over to the Romans, he wouldn't have been crucified and we would not have been saved. If the disciples had not denied the Lord Jesus Christ and abandoned him on that particular day, they wouldn't have been nearly as useful to him in the ministry. They needed to see just how strong they were without him. They weren't very strong, neither are we. They needed to know how much they needed God's grace. God sovereignly gives grace where he wills. He sovereignly withholds his grace when and where he pleases in order to bring about what it is he has planned. Sometimes he's going to give you grace to stand. And when he does, you should certainly thank him for it. But sometimes he is going to withhold his grace and allow you to fall, to fall into sin. Now, when that happens, remember two things. First of all, you can never blame God for your sin. You are responsible for your choices at all times. Remember, if God hadn't given you his grace in the first place, you would only choose evil. And now that he's given you his grace and you choose something that's wrong, is God responsible for that? Of course he isn't. You are responsible. You need to repent because you chose to do the wrong thing. You also need to seek him for grace the next time to make sure that you have the strength to do what's right. That's the reason why God allows us to fall is so we will seek him for greater grace. But remember secondly, that when God determines that you are going to fall into sin, he always does it, if you are a believer, in order to bring something good into your life. By the way, that applies not just to your falls into sin, but that applies to everything that happens to you. God only allows these falls, he only allows the difficult circumstances, the afflictions, and everything that we have to face in our lives, not to destroy us, not to weaken us, not to make us fall away from him, but rather that we might grow closer to him and more like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we wonder how the Lord can do that in those circumstances. It seems like it's gonna bring about just the opposite result I'm so weak, I'm so tired, I'm so sinful. How can I ever become more like Jesus by handing, being handed over more to those things? And yet it's exactly those things that bring about the results that God wants. Why does it happen that way? Well, if we had some time, perhaps we could go into it and, and try to figure it out. I don't know exactly why it happens that way, but we do know that it does. It was good that I was afflicted that I might learn to obey your commandments. God says that you will experience many afflictions. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. 
But the Lord delivers him or delivers them out of them all. Affliction is good. Jesus says, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. These things he brings into our lives for a good purpose, not only to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ, but also to bring glory to his name in actually taking situations like this and improving you through those things. God's love for you and his grace is so great that he is going to take even your sins and turn those things into blessings for you. The disciples were going to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. They were all going to abandon him and fall away. But in the end, none of them actually did fall away entirely, did they? They all came back. They were all strengthened by the Lord. They all became useful to him. The Lord took that circumstance and turned it around for good things. So again, remember that God is in absolute control of everything that takes place in your life. He's told you ahead of time that affliction is going to come, but that is for your good. God is going to work it together for your good. Even your sins, he's going to work together for your good because God in his infinite love has determined to do that. This is only by his grace. And let me just say this as well. He's going to cause all the things that happen in your life to conspire together to bring you to heaven. Far from letting you fall away, he's actually working in your life to draw you nearer, to make you more like him and fit for heaven so that you'll be ready when the day comes. God is sovereign. So we should thank him when those things come into our lives. Praise him for his infinite love. I mean, he even took the murder of his own son and turned that into the greatest blessing that we could possibly know, the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. Now, let me just say in closing that this is only true for you if you really have trusted Jesus Christ. And I don't mean if you've just stood up here and say, I'm going to do this, I believe this, and so forth. I think that's important, but only if it's true. It has to be true of you. If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, the Lord is not working your sins together for good. He's not working your afflictions and circumstances in your life together for good. But rather, the Bible says, he is going to hold you accountable for every single sin that you commit. Jesus says that even every idle word that a man speaks, or a woman, or a child, is going to be brought into account against them on the day of judgment. Unless, of course, you turn from your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says that if you will do that, he will make the slate clean. He will forgive all your sins. Not one single thing that you've done. Not one sin will ever be brought up against you on the day of judgment. Even every idle word that you've spoken will be removed and you will be presented before him absolutely holy and absolutely blameless. As a matter of fact, if you do come to Christ, you will find that everything that has happened to you in your life up to the present and everything that happens from that point on, God has brought into your life for one reason only, and that is to make you his child and to prepare you for heaven. I know all of us have things in our past that we hate, things that happened to us that were terrible, things we did that were terrible. But if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you trust in him and you show that you are one of his elect and you can know that even those things that happened to you in the past, all those horrible things were meant to bring you to him and were meant to make you the kind of person that you are, God is going to take all those things and turn them around for some good. I know we wish that we could change the past. We can't. But just remember that God is sovereign over the past, and God can take those things and turn them into blessings if you trust in him. The Lord is in absolute control of all things. By the way, that also means that in his plan, he planned that the gospel be offered to you this morning. God is infinitely gracious and merciful as we've seen, and God is willing to offer a full pardon and infinite love and eternal life and a future in heaven even to his enemies. All you have to do is receive it. 
trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and turn from your sins. Now let me just remind those of you who may have heard this offer before but haven't responded to it. We tend to think that things are going to remain as they are right now. Things are not going to change. Those who are young think they're going to stay young even though they know people grow old. You always think you're going to be the exception until it happens to you. Okay, that's the way we are. We just think things are going to remain th that way. And we think that we're always going to have the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ, that it's going to be there all the time. But you do need to realize that every time you hear the gospel and you don't respond to it, your heart becomes that much harder. And the likelihood, humanly speaking, of receiving the Lord becomes more remote. I think I told you that Edwards believed that very few people on their deathbed in their old age really receive the Lord because they've spent their whole lives resisting the Spirit of God, resisting the offer of the gospel. God still can save, but he believes that God usually works within you know, the bounds of, of the way things fall out in the world, that he's offered the gospel so many times and you refuse it so many times, you offend God. And there is a point of no return. So don't take it for granted. The offer is always going to be there. If there is any concern, any desire at all, seek the Lord while he may be found. Ask him for that grace and that mercy to change your heart, to give you the grace to come to him. And you'll find that if you do, that he will receive you with open arms. The Lord says, he beckons all to come to him who are weary and heavy laden. Are you tired of your sins? If you are, it's because the Lord has opened your eyes to see what a burden those sins are, that you might grow weary of them to prepare you to come to him. Jesus calls you to come. So listen to him and respond to him and receive his offer of free pardon and mercy and grace. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would help us, each of us to respond to the things we've heard in the way that we need to.